Titus, as we know from verse 1, was one of the spiritual sons of, of the Apostle Paul. Paul mentions two men that he took under his wings that he developed and nurtured as, as preachers, as, as young men that were developing. One was Timothy, one was Titus. Both those young men he called my own sons under the faith. Uh, that, that's really gripped my heart quite a bit. We've got a lot of good young men coming up in our ranks there, and uh, I like to, like to think that we're just nurturing sons in the faith or for the Lord. And Titus was a young man that got set apart and called to be a preacher and a pastor. Some believe that Justice, who is mentioned in Acts 18 at the city of Corinth, could have been Titus because he's known as Justice Titus. Some believe that could have been Titus. I'm not really sure of that. I look at the journeys where Paul was at. We know one thing, though. Titus was, a, was, a, was Grecian. He was not a Jew. He was a proselyte to the Jewish faith and came to know Christ as a Savior. He was Grecian. He was a young man who Paul influenced. God, Paul brought him under his wings. Paul sent him out on certain endeavors. We read about some of that in 2 Corinthians. Titus was a young man to refresh the heart of the Apostle Paul. He encouraged him. He talked about the joy of Titus, that, that Titus brought joy to Paul's heart, and Titus brought joy to the heart of the Corinthian believers. May I say to every young man that's being nurtured right now in our church, you ought to bring joy to your preacher. You ought to bring joy to the ones who are nurturing you and spending time with you there. Uh, Titus accompanied Paul on a journey to the island of Crete, and the two of them together saw the great need on that island. Paul did not was not the one to start churches online. The gospel actually was brought there by other men. We'll say something about that in a little bit later. But other men brought the gospel to the island of Crete. But Paul came there and he kind of just took what was there and built upon that and did something great with that there. And so Titus is there with Paul and Paul, Paul was realizing some needs. Paul could not stay for a long time on the island of Crete, but he felt like if I, if I, uh, he was thinking, well, if I leave this island, there's, there's so many things that are wanting. He said, and, he, and he just prayed over that and spent some time. And he, and he, and he, and he told Titus in verse 5, he says, now I want you to know something. He said, for this cause left I thee in Crete. He said, he said, Paul, he said Titus, I know that this is, a, this is not the easiest places to stay, but I want you, I'm going to leave you here. I want you to stay here. I need you to set in order the things that are wanting. He said, there's some things to be set in order. Now, we're going we're to address some of that during this series about things we need to set in order. Uh, we want to take a close look at areas of our lives and areas of our practices and areas of our ministry. And we want to set in order those things that are wanting. I want you to notice three things tonight as we begin this series. Number one, I want you to consider the district. I want you to consider with me the island of Crete so we can have an understanding why Paul went there and why Paul left Titus there. And we're going to constantly come back to this area. Now, Crete is one of the largest islands on the, in the Mediterranean Sea area there. There's, there are five islands. It's the fifth largest of, of the islands. There is Sicily, there's Sardinia, there's Cyprus, there's Corsica, and then there's, there's Crete. This is one of five major islands that are in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. We know about Crete from Acts 27 because in Acts 27, Paul is just making his journey to Rome. He left there. He left there on the, on the shores of the, on the, eastern, uh, the western shores there, made his way across. They, they actually banked there or stopped there in Crete before they, they, they encountered that great storm there during, the, during the, uh, the, what was called the winter months there. Crete was not necessarily a big island, but it was somewhat larger than some of the islands we think of there, much larger than any of the Hawaiian islands. It's 156 miles in length and anywhere from 7, depending how you measure it, from 7 to 35 miles in width. It is, a, it is an island of valleys and mountains. There's, there's level areas, there are valley areas, there are mountainous areas. There are highlands. Uh, the highest peak, uh, as far as uh, mountains are concerned, is Mount Ida. If you research there, it's a, it's a place that's snow-capped almost year-round. Mount Ida reaches about 8,035 feet in height there, above sea level there. And so it was an island that was highly populated. Uh, it was an island during the first century that was united to the Roman province of Serene. And uh, it was connected there until about 100 A.D. When they hit 100 A.D., they annexed it and, and connected it to Achaia and Macedonia there. It's a very important island. It was an island that was a bridge between Greece and Africa and if you would, Asia Minor and Africa. It was a stopping point in many ways. Uh, Crete, if you know anything about Greek mythology, Crete, the island of Crete, was very prominent in Greek mythology. You might, if you read any Greek mythology, you might remember about there was a minotaur, and I think the minotaur the, in Greek mythology came off the island of Crete there. So there was, a lot of, there was a lot of superstition, there was a lot of paganism that was there. Actually, the, the, the island of Crete, uh, they say some of the earliest settlers came from the area of Palestine. 
Now, the area of Palestine would mean if there were early settlers that came there from Palestine, that would mean that even at that time, there was a Jewish influence that happened there. Now, there were synagogues on the island of Crete, and there was a large Jewish, Jewish presence there, and so that Jewish presence uh, kind of grew, and people came and go, went, went there. Uh, this was an island, as we read later on in chapter 1, that had this very strong pagan influence. Go down with me, if you would, please, in verse 12, and verse 12 says, what in themselves, even a prophet of their own said, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now that's kind of interesting. He doesn't, he doesn't have a very good description. The people of Crete did not have a very good reputation. They were called number one liars. So they were known and reputed to be people that did not tell the truth. They misrepresented things they said. They fabricated lies. These people were liars. That automatically should send some red flags up because of their liars. These are not really people that you could trust. And these are not really people that you would do business with. He said, number one, they're liars. Number two, he said they were evil beasts. Now, the idea of evil beasts, we find that also mentioned about the people of Ephesus, that Paul referred to them as evil beasts. Now, what does that mean? Well, they were somewhat, they were, they were somewhat coarse. They were somewhat animalistic. They were brutes. They were mean. They had no heart. They had no conscience. And so they were called evil beasts there. Uh, they, were, they were very rough people to deal with there. But then he said they were slow bellies. That doesn't mean they had a digestive problem. Amen? Slow bellies means that they were lazy, okay? They were, they were slothful and they were lazy and they kind of hung around there and just kind of wasted their time there. And so even one of their own prophets mentioned that these people not, not being, not being very, a very good natured people. And then Paul said this in verse 13. He said this witness is true. Now as you study through the book of Titus, you want to take note of the fact that he emphasizes truth and things that are true. And uh, because, we, because in leaving Titus there, Titus was, being, was dealing with People that were liars, people that had no, they didn't blush when they lied. Uh, they, they, did, they didn't have no conscience about lying there. And so it was a very pagan area. It was a city that was, as I mentioned, that was highly populated there. The very first mention of Crete that we have in the Bible, in, at least in the New Testament, happens to be in Acts chapter 2, verse 11. There on the day of Pentecost, there were men from all over, and we're told there were men of Crete that were there. And it, most likely those men of Crete heard the gospel when Peter preached that great sermon, that Pentecost sermon there in Acts chapter 2, and uh, as he preached that sermon, the Bible says over 3,000 trusted Jesus as Savior. Most likely among those Jewish, the Jewish people that got saved, there were men of Crete that got saved. They got saved there. Those men of Crete went back to the island of Crete. They told about that experience. They told about being born again. They shared it, and the gospel spread on, on, on there on the island of Crete. It's amazing. They took their witness there and just told people about Jesus, and God, God started something. If you read through the book of Acts, it's amazing how people were there, were there in that first day there in in that uh, there in the day of Pentecost, and then went to different places. We read about that in Acts chapter 11, how some Jews or some Greek people went back to, to the city of Antioch of Syria, and they told their experiences and testified of what Jesus did there, and the, and the gospel spread there. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing that was there. Paul went there, and he preached there. Peter, P, Peter preached there. I mean, when we go to the island, we look at the island of Crete, it was a place where the gospel had spread to. And so Paul and Titus made a trip there. And Paul saw some things that burned his heart, but he couldn't stay there. And so, Titus, you need to stay there. Uh, the, one of the things they surveyed when they did there, I was doing some research on the island of Crete. They said at the time that Paul went there, there was anywhere from 95 to 100 cities on that little island. That's amazing. A si an island that was 150 miles long had anywhere from 95 to 100 cities. Now, they weren't all large cities. There were some maybe big cities. And there are probably some little towns, and there are probably some little villages. But the fact of the matter is, there are 95 to 100 locations where, or if you want in this district, locations that had people in them. Paul saw this. Titus saw this, and they realized it was a daunting task, and they realized in their survey that there were, there were believers in some of these cities, but they were not grounded. And so he gave Titus, which is a future message, he gave Titus a, 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 a commandment. He says, now, I've left you here in Crete that you would set in order the things that are wanting, and then he said, you need to set some things in order. You need to establish local New Testament churches. You need to establish Bible institutes. You need to establish Bible colleges. You need to establish discipleship programs. You need to establish so many programs. You need to set in order things that are wanting. There are things that are missing in those local church settings that they need. And he said, foremost of that, we need some structure and we need some programs and we need some ministries. But he said, we need some pastors on top of that. He said, you need to ordain elders in every city. He said, now, now Titus, he said, I've trained you how to, how to develop men of God. I've trained you in what to do. We need to develop some men of God there. And so they saw a need there on the island of Crete. May say in some total about this district, Crete needed Jesus Christ. Christ. 
San Leandro needs Jesus Christ. Oakland needs Jesus Christ. San Jose needs Jesus Christ. San Francisco needs Jesus. Listen, this whole area needs Jesus. God's left us here to reach this area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not in church to play church. We're not in church to occupy our time. We're not in church to just, just to be, make like our friendships, this and we need all that. We are in church because there is a need, there is a world out there that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got HBC Care Sunday this coming week. Would you grab some tracks? Would you take some extra time with us this week? Let our community know, and that includes outlying cities, that HBC cares. Get them to church. Knock on a few more doors. Get some FaceTime with people, amen? Just don't have door time, have FaceTime, amen? Some of you need to get off FaceTime, get off Mita, and have some real FaceTime, amen, with real people. People come to church. You take some time for them. You sow some seeds. You represent the church. Uh, you, you represent the church with a good demeanor, and you represent the church by saying, listen, this is a great place to raise your family. It's a good place for you to be. And I'm just saying today, as we go into next Sunday, H, listen, this area needs Jesus Christ. Pray for our area that this year we'll do more than we've ever done before in reaching people with the gospel. Pray for the city you reside in. You don't live in San Leandro. Pray for the city you reside in, that God will use us in touching that city. Reach them folks. My wife and I uh, we had a really, really, just a, a busy but really good day yesterday. On the way home late in the afternoon, we stopped off at Costco to pick up some things. And, of course, for me, I don't, I don't, I, it's got, I have mixed feelings about going to Costco Saturdays because it's really busy and, you know, just a lot of crowds there. But at the same time, there's people there. And so, uh, you know, we were just kind of getting our things, and I went ahead and went to the self-checkout stand and checked out some things, and, and, uh, and while I was making my way out, I, 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 I was thinking, okay, I'll, uh, we normally catch up. She catches up with me, and we meet over by the, the, the deli there or whatever, the food stand or wherever it is there. It's, it's easy to find me over there. I'm not eating, but she just finds me over there, you know? And so, uh, and so, uh, so I'm, I'm there. I'm walking up there, and I, I noticed in the Costco we're in, they moved the coffee grinder machines. Uh, you know, I'm a coffee fan, so I like to know where the coffee grinder machines are, amen? You know, you got to know where things are at, amen? You need to know where the restrooms are, and you need to know where the coffee grinder machines are, amen, you know? So I noticed it was there, and I saw two people there. I saw a husband and wife there that I recognized. They got saved in our church. And they had their backs turned, and I could tell the husband needed some help. He didn't know how to grind the coffee. I said, I can help you with that, amen, you know? And he was fumbling around with it, and... Uh, and my wife wasn't there yet, and I went up to him. And, of course, you know, if somebody comes around you, especially if it's a man, he puts his arm around your neck, you know, you get a little nervous about that, right? I did that, amen? And I went around, and I, but I made sure he wouldn't hit me, too, so I blocked him so he wouldn't hit me there, too, you know? So I put my arm around his neck there, and I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, pastor, turned white as a ghost. His wife, his wife looked at me and said, ah, pastor! You look good! They had age. I didn't know what to say, man, you know. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth, amen. I mean, they still look good, amen. At my age, anybody my age is looking good, amen, you know. And we talked for 20, 25 minutes. I said, hey, you know, we're going to start an extension ministry out here. He said, really? Yeah. We're, we're, we're getting that ready. I'm looking for property right now. They got saved in our church. They stopped going from just unfortunate situation that happened, but I stayed in touch with them. Kept on loving on them. Every, every Christmas, my wife and I send them a Christmas greeting, and we've got their birthdays, and when it pops up, I, I send them a birthday greeting. And, it's been, and I, I was telling my wife we were going home after we spent, and she came along, and, you know, we, like I said, we talked to her for about 20, 25 minutes there, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, we, 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 we are, their contact information is still on our phone, and, and uh, you know, we both looked at each other and said, that was a providential appointment, amen? And for no other reason, I'm glad I went there to find that couple, Amen? I'm just saying today, you just, we got to look for people. We've got to realize we're in an area that's highly popular. We're in an area that needs Jesus Christ. Number two, would you notice this? We see the district. Would you notice the deficiency? 
Paul told Timothy that there were things that were wanting. Wanting means deficient, means lacking. Last week I preached a message, something's missing. Something's missing. I mean, Paul, as you read through the book of Titus, he's emphasizing the importance of godliness. I May mean, remind you today, God, God, did not, God did not save you and I to be, to be like the animals, to be like the evil beasts of our society. God saved us to rise above that and to have godliness, amen? Godliness was lacking. Uh, truthfulness was lacking. Modeling the right example was lacking. You go over to chapter 2, and uh, Paul told this to Timothy, to Titus. He said, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, one of the words that recurrently happens here in chapters 1, 2, and 3 is the word sound. That means healthy. That means healthy. Whole. Unblemished. Healthy doctrine. He says, and you know, when he's talking about speaking sound doctrine, he's telling you, you need to teach them. But you need to model for them. And you need to show them. Listen, the best way we can demonstrate doctrine is through our testimony for Jesus Christ. And he's talking about, he's just dealing, we'll get to it somewhere soon, about the men and the women in the church and modeling being good examples. And he's actually talking about parenting here and our marriages here. And he's talking about our home lives there. And he talks about young men. Listen, he said in verse 6, he said, young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. And, uh, and he told Titus, he said, no, Titus, he said, now listen, I, I know your personality. He says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. And you find one of the things that he mentions is about good works. I mean, there were a lot of things that were lacking. Good examples were lacking. Good works were lacking. Uh, pastors were lacking in every city. I want, I want to put an urgency as we preach to the book of Titus. Maybe God would move on some men. Maybe during this series, God is going to move on some men to call you to be a preacher of the gospel. Maybe God's going to move on some of you to realizing that maybe God is giving you the gift of shepherding, the gift of pastoring, and realizing as we survey cities, our goal is not to, is not to have a, a popery kingdom around us here, but the realization that we want to establish works that are thriving and growing and people getting saved and people getting to the baptistry and adding them to the church and realize they need to be pastored. P Listen, churches need to be pastored. Things were lacking. There was a greater emphasis on preaching the gospel that was lacking. Listen, a church plant that is going forward will always have things that are wanting. I just got a text message from uh, Pastor James Kim there. We kind of stay in contact during the week about how his church is doing down in Irvine. His church is doing well, and I'm glad we're supporting him. And we have, we have two students we've sent to him, two students down at UC Irvine that are attending church. And this morning at 830, he sent me a picture. He took a picture of both of them. They came to church this morning, amen. One just got saved about three weeks ago and uh, went back to school down there. And we got, got, got uh, the student connected with Pastor Kim. And this is two weeks in a row the student's gone. Another one has kind of grown through our church there and has been coming consistently since the church started there. I'm thankful for that. Those are good reports. But I'll tell you, every time I talk to Brother Kim, every, talk to, every time I talk to Pastor Newton down there in, in uh, Calabresa, uh, there, there's always needs. There's always needs. I mean, they, they need a sound system. They need some chairs. Uh, they need more laborers. They need more helpers. And uh, you know how it is when you have a church plant. There's all this momentum you build up, and uh, everybody wants to come to help you. And they'll, the Bible college will send their students, and church will send some workers. And uh, after they think they've helped you, you know, about about two or three months later, you're just you're realizing, man, you need some laborers because everybody else is busy doing their thing. You need some help there. There are things that are lacking. There are things they're wanting. I want to tell you right now. I need soul winners in West Contra Costa. I need people to go to West Contra Costa. Listen, we've got cities there, starting with Berkeley. But how many understand Berkeley needs Jesus? Amen? Amen. Now, there's a lot of churches in Berkeley, but they're politically based churches. They're liberal churches. There are no Bible, strong Bible preaching, Bible believing churches there. Berkeley needs Jesus. You see, Berkeley needs Jesus. Listen, we've got Berkeley, we've got Albany, we've got, we've got a, a couple families here in our church that are from Albany. Albany's Jesus, El Cerrito and El Sobrani. We've got a, there's a good church in El, El Cerrito there, and I don't want to take anything away from them. We, we were, we're not going to disrupt that there. But in El Sobrani, in Kensington, listen, they need Jesus. Kensington is kind of the high, high end area there of that area of the world. They, they need Jesus. San Pablo needs Jesus. Richmond needs Jesus. Listen, uh, uh, Hercules needs Jesus. Rodeo needs Jesus. Pinole needs Jesus. Listen, Vallejo needs, listen, Vallejo needs Jesus back. Badly. San Rafael needs Jesus. Petaluma needs Jesus there, okay? Hey, listen, I've gone, I've gone over to the brother, brother Mrs. Perez's house numerous times. We've had gospel outreach in their homes. Every time we've had a gospel outreach, we've always had efforts of 10 people saved in those meetings there. I'd like to do that every single week there. 
And I promise you, Mrs. Mariana and Brother Carlos, they'll get those visitors there. They'll get the people there from all over the place. There. They'll get them there and we'll feed them. Amen. We'll feed them. But we're going to preach the gospel to them. We need people there. I'm thankful for our Saturday sow winning. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to announce it right now. It's not on the counter. Saturday, May 4th, all church sow winning. Didn't hear a lot of amens on that one. I'm doing it before graduations come. I'm doing it before the ladies' meeting comes. I'm doing it before a lot of busyness comes. Why? Because I'm watching our trending. Whenever our trending starts to decrease a little bit, I realize there's sickness. And I realize there's busyness and vacations. And I'm all for that. Please don't misunderstand me. But I'm also, I, I'm also studying the heartbeat of our church. The heartbeat of our church is reaching people for Christ. Right. You be here on May 4th, amen? Get some training on May 4th. We'll take a few minutes. We'll train you how to be an effective soul winner, how to say certain things and what God will do. And we're going to pray for God's power that day. And we're praying that we'll get out maybe 2,000, 3,000 invitations that Saturday and get some people there. Maybe the, 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 the after effect of that is people come to church, amen? amen. Things that are wanting. We need to win more souls to Christ. Uh, for some of you, this is an area that's wanting. Uh, we need some of you to just really pray and ask God to help develop you so you'll experience the joy of giving the gospel to someone and watch them trust Jesus Christ, their Savior. Things that are wanting. Uh, we need more qualified and trained disciples. We need to place an extension ministry to every city that's within 20 to 45 minutes away from here. We need to start more growth groups. Uh, we need people tithing. We need people giving their offerings. We need to take on more missionaries. We need more compassion. We need more holy... I'm, I'm talking about things that are wanting, amen? We need more compassion. We need more holy boldness. We need more prayer. Amen. We need more holiness. Amen. Things that are wanting. We need more of the Spirit's boldness. More of the Spirit's power, things that are wanting. We need more godly men and godly women. We need more holiness. We need more humility. We need, there are things that are wanting. He said, Titus, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst have set in order the things that are wanting. Listen, there are things that are wanting in your life, things that are wanting in my life. There are things that you need right now. You have a certain need. You maybe have a financial need. Maybe you have an emotional need. Maybe you have a, maybe you have a voice in your life. There's are things that are wanting. Listen, we've got to stay at it. We've got to pray at it. We've got to ask, Lord, God, would you help us for the things that are wanting right now? We see the district, we see the deficiency. Would you notice one more thing this evening? Would you notice the definite? Paul, in these three short chapters, in fact, the entire book of Titus is shorter than some, of, some chapters in the Old Testament. <laughs> I give you a project, you, before you go to sleep tonight, read the book of Titus. You'll get through it very quickly. Or you'll take your time and read and get convicted on just the words in the book of Titus. And Paul does a monumental work of expounding and writing on doctrines, practical Christian living, how we should conduct ourselves in the house of God. I mean, look at it. He writes about godliness, which was a big need in that society. He writes about faith. He speaks about eternal life. Uh, the, the, the Godhead is mentioned in this book, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. He talked about, he talked about the second coming. He talked about salvation. In chapter 2, as I mentioned before, he talked about roles of men and women in the church. He talks about Christians in the workplace. I mean, it's all here. But foremost of what he writes about is a doctrinal statement I'm going to make right now that is very definite. Paul writes and speaks about God. Because where God's name is mentioned, we would do well to stop and pause and think about what is being said about God. And you'll notice in, verse, in this chapter, he starts off by just talking about in verse 1 that about the servant of God. He speaks about the faith of God's elect. He speaks about, in, in verse 3, God our Savior, and he equates how Jesus and God are one and the same. Because he speaks of God our Savior and Jesus our Savior. He speaks about God our Father in verse 4. 
He speaks about God our Savior in chapter 1, verse 3, and again in chapter 2, verse, chapter two, verse 10. Uh, you go to chapter 2, verse 13, he speaks about God is great. He's saying, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious spirit of the great God. A God is great, amen? In a society that was pagan, in a society that was elevating Artemis, in a society that was elevating the, the Grecian gods, he said, well, God's bigger than Zeus, amen? And God's greater than Zeus, because Zeus, Zeus is not real. God is real, amen? amen. God is great, okay? Zeus is a myth. God is real, amen? amen? He says, I just want you to understand, he says, there's some things about God, but he says something very definitive here that, that we can't lose sight of here, and I want you to notice as we close tonight. Go with me to chapter one, and notice in verse three, he says, he says in verse two, excuse me, let me start with verse one. He said, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, he says, in hope of eternal life, would you notice this next statement here, because this is a definite, which God that cannot lie. Amen. That's right. Now Paul told Titus, I'm leaving you here in an island and on a society where everyone here is a liar. Right. There's no truth here. Right. There's an absolute truth, why? Because Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. You must understand sometimes when temptation comes, whatever Satan's put in your mind, that's a lie. That's a lie. And there were liars on this island. There were false teachers. False teachers promote a lie. False teachers get on the airwaves. False teachers write books. False teachers want to get you from reading the Bible to reading some cockeyed book that's written by man. Listen, those books are not inspired by God. Those books are inspired by man. And a lot of those books, you read some cockeye, cockeye type of doctrine that's there that's not appropriate, not biblically right, which the Bible itself corrects there, and you get off there and you get wrong doctrine because you're believing a lie. And he's saying here, listen, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now here's the definite, God cannot lie. God is the true God. God is, God is truth. Listen, that's who his nature is. God cannot lie. Look with me in Hebrews 6.18. In Hebrews 6.18, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is the Apostle Paul, made this powerful statement. He said in Hebrews 6.18, uh, let, me get, let me get there real quickly here. And he's speaking here about the covenant that God gave to Abraham here. And he says here in verse 17, about, uh, Hebrews 6, 17, 6, chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Immutability means the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. And he's talking about how God confirmed his promise, the covenant to Abraham through an oath. Okay, he did two things. He said, he said there are two immutable things. The mutable thing that was unchanged, number one, God promised it. God cannot lie. Right. Number two, he promised it and he performed it through the cutting of a covenant. We read about that in Genesis 15. Now go back there and notice what it says in verse 18. In verse 18, he's, verse 17 again, wherein God willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath. No, notice verse 18. That by two immutable things, two unchangeable things. Number one, he said this. In, here's the immutable thing number one. In which it was impossible for God to lie. I want you to understand something. It's impossible. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to God. Hey, listen, listen to what the Bible says in Numbers 23, 19. Numbers 23, 19. He says in Numbers 23, 19, this, this promise here. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath he spoken? Has he said and shall he not do it? Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? God is not a man that he should die, nor the son of, that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Listen, God, beloved, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Now, what does that mean? Number one, there, there are truths in this book that are not lies. Eternal life, what, everything God says about eternal life is truth, okay? He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can trust the fact when God says eternal life is a gift, it is a gift. God cannot lie. That's right. Okay, eternal life can be possessed through faith. The Bible says, you look at all the verily verilies in, 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 in the Gospel of John. By the way, the Gospel of John, I was just taking a new family that were discipling through this, and I was explaining to them, when you read through the Gospel of John, what, what the emphasis there is on the person of Jesus Christ, that he's perfect God and perfect 
perfect man. And it said, one of the things you find about the Gospel of John is the emphasis on truth. Truth is repeated over and over again. And by the way, truth is Jesus Christ. Amen? Right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. He says, if you know the truth, it will set you free. Listen, right. the truth is Jesus Christ, sir. Right. And I was explaining that, that to them. But the Bible also tells us Satan's a liar there. But watch this. As you think about the truth of God's word, here's what the Bible says. All these verily, verilys you find in the Gospel of John that Jesus uses recurrently, verily, verily means truly, truly. Verily, verily basically means I'm telling you the truth once, I'm telling you the truth twice. That's what he's saying. Because whenever they repeated something, they knew that the listeners had to be reaffirmed by saying something like this. Truly, truly, or amen, amen, or verily, verily, I want you to know what I'm telling you is true. Now here's one of the very verities we find in the Bible. One of the very verities is John 3, 3. Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. That's right. Now that's the truth. God did not lie. God said you have to be born again spiritually. Some people think that they can be baptized and be saved. No, that's a lie. That's right. The truth of the Bible says there, verily, verily, I say to thee, he, he says there, except a man be born again, he cannot enter to the kingdom of heaven. I look later on, John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, the same hath everlasting life, and shall not see condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What did he say there? The same thing he's saying here, that God has promised, that, that he says here, God cannot lie, he's promised eternal life. I want to tell you tonight, eternal life is not something that is evasive, and eternal life is not something that you cannot obtain, and eternal life is not something that you earn by good works. And eternal life is not something you have to die for. And eternal life is not something that you give your wealth for. No, listen, eternal life is a gift of God. That is the truth of God's word. It's not a lie. It's the truth from God. God doesn't lie about faith. He talks about the faith of God's elect, okay? What does it mean, God's elect? He's talking about God's people. Don't get all whacked out about that, okay? You say, well, oh, that must mean Paul was into Calvinism. That has nothing to do with that. Calvinism, the term Calvinism wasn't even in existence in the Bible that time. Election talks about God's people, not about the unsaved. It's a, it's a term dealing with sanctification, not soteriology. Somebody help me with that tonight, amen? Now God's not telling, he's telling the truth about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's not a lie, that's the truth. I mean, when we look at the God's word, when we look at God's word, it's contained, this is truth. Right. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Now why am I telling you all this, okay? God cannot lie. God doesn't lie to you about the promises. God doesn't lie to you about how to get answered prayer. God doesn't lie to you about how to live the Christian life. God doesn't lie to you about there's judgment to come. God does not lie. There is judgment to come. God is not lying that there's a heaven, there's hell. So, somebody the other day said, well, I'm not really sure heaven's real. And I'm not really sure hell's real. Oh, let me show you tonight. It's real because it's in the Bible. God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. Hell is real. Heaven's real. Jesus said there, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. That's the truth. It's not a lie. God cannot lie. When you accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, I use this illustration all the time. You accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, guess what God does? He immediately says there, I go to prepare a place for you. He's building your mansion up in heaven. He starts a construction process and he's building upon it through your life there and he's building on it. And the moment you breathe your last life, your breath, last breath of air in this life, that, that mansion in heaven is prepared for your occupancy. It's ready for you to occupy. That's a promise. That's not a lie. Well, some people struggle with eternal security. They wonder if they're, going, if they're really saved. And let me tell you, the Bible tells you certainly that you're saved. There are many, many verses that assure that he that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. The Bible says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Oh, listen, John 10, 28 says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's, that's the assurance of God. Listen, the assurance of salvation is not a lie. It is the truth. God does not lie. Right. God doesn't lie about his blessings on our life. Right. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt find good success. God is not lying about how to find prosperity. God is not lying about how to find good success. But your idea of prosperity, your idea of good success, is not material success and not, not, not material prosperity. He's talking about the spiritual hand of God. The unseen hand of God is what's sung about tonight. Right. Oh, listen, God, God doesn't lie when he says, I, I'm with you always. God doesn't lie when he said in Psalm 46, verse 1, God is a re our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of need. That's not a lie. That's the truth. That's right. You can, listen, Jesus is our rock in whom we can hide. He's a shelter in the time of storm, amen? amen. God cannot lie. That's right. That's why you can trust his word. Amen. Stop doubting his word. Stop doubting his promises. Right. Stop doubting his commands. You say, God, he said, preacher, the commands of God are hard. No, they're not. The commands of God are not grievous, 1 John 5, 4. That's right. They're not grievous. 
God cannot lie. God doesn't lie that he loves you. God doesn't lie that he forgives you. God doesn't lie that he, his mercies are abundant and his mercies endure forever and his mercies are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God, amen? amen. God cannot lie. You read your book, you read your Bible tonight, you read your, your Bible tomorrow, you have the only book in all the world that does not lie. It's an infinite book. God cannot lie. Because his author is not a liar, its author is truth. It's impossible for God to lie. And Paul, as he wrote in that society, there was filled with paganism and liars. The Christians are liars and evil beasts and slow bellies. He said, listen, he said, he said, Titus, someone's going to have to take a stand there, and you're going to have to ordain elders in every city. You're going to have to get men that meet the qualification of the pastorate. You're going to have to ordain elders in every city. You're going to have to emphasize living uh, godly lives. Listen, the, listen, you go, you, you, you change, listen, you change church from here, and you go to some watered-down church. They'll let you live any way you want to live because they're going to tell you grace is a license to sin. They're going to promote the false doctrine of antinomianism. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly lusts. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I mean, for Titus to get up as a preacher boy under the wings and shadow of the the Apostle Paul and to stand in those pulpits and to train men of God that would have some fiber and some backbone and some courage and to take their Bible and take a stand and say, listen, listen, your prophet said you guys are liars. I want you to know everything you believe before is a lie, but what I've got for you is the truth. Amen. And he had to get up in those pulpits and tell them God cannot lie. That's right. Here's our problem. Here's our problem. We know the truth. We believe the truth. But in our practices, we live like God, like God tells a lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. That's what the Bible says, Amen. That God be true and every man a liar. We make up our excuses. We tell our lies. We, tell, we make these excuses to God. The truth of the matter is the Bible says that God be true and every man a liar. The Holy Spirit doesn't lie. And the Holy Spirit starts tugging at our heart and starts tugging at us there and starts tugging at our tide there and gets a hold of us. We need to obey every impulse of the Holy Spirit because God cannot lie. You don't know this service that you're in tonight might be the life-changing service you need that might change your family and change your life and maybe change what you do for Jesus Christ. And maybe in a service like this, you get called to the mission field. And maybe a service like this, you get called to preach, sir. And maybe a service like this, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of you. You have to realize God does not lie. That's right. Amen. He doesn't lie about holy living. He doesn't lie about being doctrinally correct. He doesn't lie that Jesus is coming soon, amen? Right. amen. Looking for the blessed hope. Amen. Well, you say, well, pastor, they preached about that 2,000 years ago. Listen, a 1,000 years is just one day with God. Right. Yes. Don't put time limits on God because there is no time with God. That's right. God is eternal. That's right, amen. He's everlasting because he cannot lie. Right. It's impossible for God to lie. And so... He gives us his book. If we have a God that cannot lie, you can trust him. I said you can trust him. You can trust him for your future. You can trust him for your finances. You can trust him with your frustrations. You can trust him with your feelings. You can trust him for your family. You can trust him for your forgetfulness. You can trust him for your failures. You know why? Because God cannot lie. He cannot lie. He said it is impossible for God to lie. Now, we, can know, we know that God can do anything, but there's some things God cannot do. And one of those things he cannot do, he cannot lie. And he cannot fail. Amen? And he cannot, and he, listen, he, he, he cannot, he cannot, he can't, he can't lie. God cannot sin. God cannot fail. Hey, listen, his word is true. That's right. Amen. 
His word is true. That's why I was preaching this morning when Jesus, when Jesus uh, uh, looked at that crowd and, and that poor widow woman had just put her offering in and barely made a dent in the offering and it made this little, just a very faint sound going down that, 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 uh, that trumpet tube, uh, that, that collection box there. And he said, of a truth, I tell you. He wanted to understand the truth of giving and the truth of sacrifice and the truth of costing us to do something for Jesus Christ there. When this book becomes very real to you, you realize it's truth. You want to hug it to your heart. You want to wrap your mind and your heart around the word of God because God cannot lie. He cannot lie. And if everything we have here, the promises of God are true, then you want to know God doesn't lie. You can wrap everything in your life around it. You, listen, you can trust the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can trust the Lord. He's a rock upon which we stand. He is our rock. That's right. okay. He's a shelter in the time of storm. He says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusted in thee. Great peace of they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. Why? Because God cannot lie. Right. He doesn't lie. Listen, we need to get a hold of the truths of the absoluteness of God. And tonight, when you go to prayer, you ought to say something like that. Thank you, God, that you are the true God. Amen. Thank you, God, that you are truth. Thank you, God, that you cannot lie. Thank you, God, that you're absolute. Thank you, God, that you're holy, holy, holy. You're the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. God Amen. cannot lie. We look at God's word and the brightness and effervescence of the word of God, that God cannot lie. It sheds a light on you and me and shows us how much deceitfulness, chicanery, lies, fraudulentness, deceitfulness, and guile we have in our lives. You look at that cross upon Jesus died, that wasn't a lie. He died on that cross. The other day, a man told somebody, that told my wife, they said, they said, well, I just want you to know Jesus is a fable. No, he's not a fable. That's blasphemy. He's not, he's not a fable. He's the son of God. Yes, sir. Because he cannot lie. Every single thing Jesus taught those gospels, that's not a lie. And this, and they, they get in these universities, these secular universities, these, these sinful universities. They start to tear apart the word of God and they try to affect your faith. I remember when I first got saved, they, they were, the, the, the youth director in that church was talking about this young man that was a couple years older than me and they were gloating about this young man, how great he was in the youth group at that time and you know, he was strutting his stuff and showing he was, he was all on top of it. He went to Stanford University and they destroyed his faith in the first semester. That youth director kept talking about, remember that young man, he did this? And I was glad the pastor says, listen, I, he says, in all due respect, he says, the young man made a great contribution here, but his faith got destroyed. We can't look at this young man as an example right now because he let them tear apart his faith. You know what keeps you strong in the Lord and the power of his might? That God cannot lie. That he's true. Let God be true and every man a liar. He said, God, it's impossible to lie. That's right. You can trust him. Commit your fears to the Lord. Give your failures to God. You can do what God wants you to do because God cannot lie. You can get the power of the Holy Spirit in your life because God cannot lie. That's right. You say, well, pastor, I, I, have these, I have these awful sinful habits. I, can over, I, I sympathize with you about that. But God's power and God's word says God cannot lie. He'll give you the enablement to overcome that. You can quit your smoking. You can quit your drinking. You can quit your lustful habits. You can stop gaming. Yeah, you can. Just give me your phone. I'll take care of that. Amen. I'll delete your programs for you. You won't have any problems. Amen. And I'll lock you out. Amen. You can get rid of those bad habits. You can get rid of bad thoughts. Get rid of your unforgiveness. And you get rid of your bitterness. God can't lie. He's not a liar. He's the only true God. I think we need revival tonight of truth in our lives. Being true people. That's the Bible asks. Somebody asks, are you true men? 
Are you true men? I see, are you true men? <laughs> are you true women? God cannot lie. Oh, God, I'm, life is so hard, and, and, and I feel so many difficulties, and I'm discouraged. And Lord, why, why is this happening? Listen, when you have trials, you know, this is why I'm going through the book of James. I had no idea the trials would come out in our church, but I'm telling you right now, God doesn't lie. He says, count on you and you fall into diverse temptations. Right. Nor that the trying your faith work with patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given. Hey, you know what we have? When, when things are overwhelming and things are very difficult, and we feel like we, we feel like a flood has come over us, and we feel like we're buried on the landslide, that's the time we need to stop and say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, give me wisdom to learn what I'm supposed to learn from this, because God cannot lie. Because when you look at the difficulties and you look at that, God sees gold coming out of that trial. Amen? That's right. The trial of your faith being much more precious than gold which perisheth. Right. We wonder why our prayers don't get answered and we say, well, I tried everything the Bible says. No, you didn't try it with a heart of obedience because God cannot lie. Well, I've tried to live a victorious Christian life, but, but, I, but I can't. And, you know, and there's just two sides to every coin. There's God's side, and then there's your side. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? I was sharing the first service this morning. I was reading my devotions this morning from Ezekiel chapter 20, and, and there's a statement that recurs in Ezekiel 20 where the Lord says, Now hear my commandments and hear my judgments. If you do them, ye shall live. Sometimes you get these discouraging thoughts in your life and, and the, you read the internet. The internet tells you you should take your life because your life is valueless. No, the Bible says in Deuteronomy, choose life. Yes. Beloved brother and sister in Christ, we have a God that cannot lie. That's right. You can trust him. Amen. It's time we get a revival of God's truth in our life. This book is perfect. This book right. is eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall never pass away. Why? Right. God cannot lie. That's right. You don't understand, Pastor. It's very hard. No, I don't understand. But God understands because God cannot lie. Right. Would you give your fears to God? Give your problems to the Lord? Would you, be, you know, they gave, we got the example this morning of a woman that she had nothing. But she gave it all. Right. He said she's cast in more than they all. And what God was saying to us is that this poor widow woman had enough faith to trust me. If you have an abundance of things, do you have enough faith to trust me? I promise we don't trust God. We trust Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve, more than we trust God. I wouldn't trust that guy as far as you could throw him, amen? <laughs> In fact, they ought to collapse the Federal Reserve. Somebody help me with that, amen? amen. Federal Reserve is illegal. Right. Know your economics, Federal Reserve is illegal. Manipulating the interest rates. You don't know say, Pastor, man, I've, I've got to give my time because, man, I've, I've got to build my real estate empire and I've got to build my stock. Go build it, but you can trust God. Right. You can trust God. Right. You understand, Pastor, I've got to get my bachelor's done. I've got to commit to my studies, and I get to my, you know, I wish you would meet some of our students in our colleges that are getting straight A's and doing well, and they're serving God 20 to 30 hours a week at Heritage Baptist Church. Good. And doing, they're working 20 hours, some of them working 20, 25-hour job. They're doing all that. And listen, if I called any of those students up right now, said, I'd say, hey, Brother Eugene, can you help me with something? They would say it at moments, this is, Pastor, whatever you need, I'll get it done. I'll figure out how to get it done. You know what they've learned? God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. Well, I have a staff member that came to work at our church years ago, and the staff member came, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, you're going to take a big cut and pay if you come work for us. That staff member never one time asked me how much of a pay cut. That staff member came and took an incredible pay cut. But that staff member learned something. God doesn't lie. That's right. 
Because my Bible says my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Not according to what your idea of the riches and glory are. The riches and glory are what Paul talks about in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, which has begotten us again. He says, he says, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen, the, 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 the reservoir of God never grows dry, never gets dry. And the wealth of God is never depleted. Amen? Right. Because we have a God that cannot lie. Amen. The staff member could, could tell you in the weakness of his, their faith, they can tell you this, I know God doesn't lie. Amen. I've got people in our church that deep down in their heart, they like some things to change. But they've learned like Paul in Philippians chapter 4, that in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Amen. You know how they got that place? They learned God doesn't lie. Cast your cares on Jesus today, all your burdens and cares. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. How do you know that? Because God cannot lie. Right. Amen. God cannot lie. We sang tonight, I love to tell the story. Do you? God doesn't lie. Parents, get, you, get your children together. You take the book. No matter what their intelligence level is, you tell them, hey, Sonny, Betsy, I want to tell you a great truth tonight. God cannot lie. That's good. Amen. That's good. Husbands and wives, you're struggling with so many things. Husbands, grab your wife by the hand and say, hey, listen, tonight we're taking a stand because God cannot lie. I want some of you to evaluate right now to get involved with faith promise missions. Because as we read Philippians chapter 4, God doesn't lie. He says, what you give to missions is a sweet savor and a sweet smelling savor to God. And that's where he gives Philippians 4.19. He says, now listen, you've given, and they had a trial of affliction. We know that the church of Macedonia had a great trial of affliction, but the Bible says of the abundance of their liberality. Amen. Oh, amen. Well, what did they learn from that? God doesn't lie. That's right. You say, Pastor, I'm weak, and physically I'm weak, and spiritually I'm weak, emotionally I'm weak, and I feel like I'm failing. Hey, listen, my Bible says I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me amen. because God cannot lie. That's right. you're, you're talking to someone, Paul, when he wrote that, he recognized God doesn't lie. Paul, Paul got stressed out with unanswered prayer. Did you know that? He said, I besought the Lord three times that we take away this trial from me. The Lord said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. For therein is my strength made perfect and weak. You know what Paul said about that? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may be upon me. You know what Paul was saying there? You can trust the Lord. God Amen. cannot lie. I think we need to take some time tonight Put some things on the altar and recognize we have a God that cannot lie. Amen. He wants you to get saved tonight. He invites you to call on Jesus Christ to be your Savior. He wants us to have revival on a daily basis. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? I, I'm telling you tonight, we have a God that cannot lie. He's just waiting for someone. He's just waiting for someone to trust him with all their heart and all their soul in all their mind, to trust the Lord with all thine heart, and to lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall bring it to pass. Be not wise in thine own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from him. He's looking for someone that has so much absolute trust in God that you realize, I can trust God completely and thoroughly without any doubt because I have a God that cannot lie. That's right. Amen. You say, Pastor, it's hard to live for God. It is hard to live for God. But we know we have a God that cannot lie. That's right. You can live for God. Amen. You can surrender to God and go to Bible college, young person, because you have a God that cannot lie. Amen. You can serve God and be effective because you have a God that cannot lie.